This post was originally published by the 19th on September 24, 2021. The U.S. Census Bureau in July began asking Americans about their sexual orientation and gender identity, a watershed moment that marks the first time the federal government has tried to capture data on LGBTQ plus Americans in its large real-time national surveys. The results so far are preliminary, but they do indicate that the disparities queer Americans experienced prior to the pandemic have continued to endure 18 months in. For some, those disparities have grown deeper, according to the data, which captures results from July 21 to September 13, LGBTQ plus people often reported being more likely than non-LGBTQ plus people to have lost employment, not have enough to eat, be at elevated risk of eviction or foreclosure, and face difficulty paying for basic household expenses. According to the Census Household Pulse Survey, a report that measures how Americans are faring on key economic markers during the pandemic. While think tanks like the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law and advocate-led research groups have previously studied LGBTQ plus poverty, no large government population surveys, like those conducted by the Census or the Treasury Department, have attempted to capture the real-time economic experiences of LGBTQ plus people. Previously, those analyses were limited to studies of same-sex couples, a question the census began analyzing with limited success in 1990, but that leaves out significant portion of LGBTQ plus people. Lack of accurate data on the population as a whole, and particularly on transgender people, a group that has been chronically undersurveyed, hampered any federal response to persisting inequities, advocates say. Having this on, both as a way to understand what's going on during the pandemic, but also hopefully as a starting point to more federal data collection, is really an important moment," said Bianca D.M. Wilson, the senior scholar of public policy at the Williams Institute. The data has only begun to be collected, and it's still too early to tell whether the differences between groups are representative of the LGBTQ population overall or just those who were surveyed by the census at a given moment in time. While researchers cautioned against drawing major conclusions, the trends that emerge in the data are consistent with what other surveys have found prior to the pandemic as a result of employment discrimination, underpaying, discriminatory lending practices and other policies that have limited economic mobility for queer people. According to the 19THS analysis of the first four releases of data from the census survey, as much as 23% of LGBTQ plus people and 32% of trans people reported having lost employment in the month before the census conducted its questionnaire. About 15-16% to 16 of non-LGBTQ plus people reported the same. About 12% of LGBTQ and people said they sometimes or often did not have enough to eat. 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 Eat, 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 eat. These are sort of the systemic disparities that we observed pre-pandemic, that the pandemic has not only deepened for both groups, but also sort of widened, said David Schwedman, assistant professor of public policy and administration at American University who has conducted research on same-sex couples and housing discrimination. Wilson at the Williams Institute said that absent this kind of large-scale data collection about LGBTQ plus people, policymakers couldn't truly answer big questions about whether attempts to address economic stress exacerbated by the pandemic, like the now-expired federal eviction moratorium, were working for everyone. But data collection is only one step toward equity. Dean Spade, an associate professor at Seattle University School of Law who has also advised the upcoming National LGBTQ Plus Women Asterisk S Community Survey by Think Tank Justice Work, said that real change requires more than just counting trans and LGBTQ Plus people at the federal level. Counting marginalized people to better understand the issues they face doesn't necessarily mean their suffering will be addressed through policy, he noted, 
and trans people are accustomed to social services leaving them out or not being designed with them in mind. It's why trans people, for example, are helping each other pay for medical procedures that aren't covered by insurance, housing those experiencing homelessness and creating mutual aid networks, Spade said. We're helping each other survive right now, he said. Dot, and there are still significant challenges with the data as it is. Sample sizes are small, an issue that has barred marginalized communities, including Asian women, Native Americans, and Pacific Islander women, from representation in real-time data on some national surveys. Those small sample sizes make it difficult to draw big conclusions from the data until months down the line. The Census Bureau said in a statement that it currently doesn't have additional analysis to offer on the data, though it did publish a report on the first set of LGBTQ plus data this summer, finding that LGBTQ plus people are more likely than non-LGBTQ plus people to face economic hardship. The primary focus has been on collecting and releasing data in a timely manner but there are plans in the future to release data products that will provide additional context, the Bureau said in a statement. The other challenge has been crafting questions in a way that takes into account knowledge gaps people may have about what terminology best describes them. The census survey, for example, asks respondents to choose which best represents how they think of themselves gay or lesbian, bisexual, something else, I don't know, or straight, that is not gay or lesbian. In past attempts to phrase these questions, heterosexual people have been found to incorrectly mark themselves, economists said, so additional phrases have been added to improve clarity. Thank you for watching. Please, subscribe.